things aren't quite as strong as they appear, and we may look ahead and say they're going to get worse. But the plain fact is, if you look at the macroeconomic environment right now, it is a negative environment for gold. And so the ordinary investor perhaps sees that. And what's been driving gold in particular, of course, are things, you know, central bank buying because of dollar weaponization, Chinese investors buying um, because they're worried about the banking system. Well, these people are not worried about the macroeconomic environment. That's not why they're buying gold in the first place. So it, it, it's not illogical that gold is moving up to new highs. Special coverage from the Rural Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, here from the floor of the Rural Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, the host of this channel. Really looking forward to the conversation we have lined up now with Adrian Day of Adrian Day Asset Management. Adrian, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for making the time. Well, thank you, Kai, very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's like day two, but it's already 5.30. So oh really... my gosh, I feel <laughs> like I want to go to bed for three weeks. <laughs> I, I'm here. I'm exhausted. I'm mentally drained. So I'm hoping I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping coherent during yeah. our conversation here a little bit. But we got exciting stuff to talk about that should yeah. keep us up and uh, excited and entertained here uh, for the next 25, 30 minutes. So, um, we last spoke about four months ago, and it feels like the world has changed uh, completely, yet it hasn't really, if you look at it. It's like it right. feels like we're kicking the can down the road on the macro side. Um, debt levels are steadily increasing. The Fed hasn't really cut yet, although noise is getting louder there. Um, l let's start with overall sentiment uh, and maybe strength of the economy in general. Like, how, how are you feeling about it? Yeah, no, I still think this economy, the U.S. economy in particular, we're talking U.S. here, the U.S. economy is heading towards a recession. And I think, you know, the signs are just getting clearer. And I, I was talking to someone just chatting earlier, and, and the way I would put it is that the, I've always said there's a difference between the headlines, like the unemployment number and what's happening under the hood. There's a difference between consumer spending and what's happening under the hood or the bonnet in England. And... <laughs> um, and I just think that we're starting to see those headline numbers get a little bit worse, like unemployment has ticked up, new jobs is a little worse, um, new, new unemployment claims is a little up, nothing dramatic, but just a little up. But, but if you start to look under the hood of these things, I, I, think, I, I think things are a, a lot more serious, a lot more negative than, than the headlines suggest. And unemployment, just quickly, unemployment, I mean, um, we, we can talk about government, most of the new jobs are government jobs or government-related jobs, uh, a lot of people working two jobs, a lot of part-time jobs. But the reality is that despite the payroll numbers going up for the last two years in a straight line and looking very, very strong, the reality is that the U.S. economy has lost last year over a million full-time private sector jobs. And it's full-time private sector jobs that are driving the economy. You know, you can have all the government jobs you want. That doesn't make a strong economy. I recently learned about the U6 unemployment rate, yeah. which, has, which is showing a seven handle. Which, uh, you know, it's according to standards back in the 1990s, like we're at 7% unemployment rate, roughly. Right. right. And official unemployment numbers these days is 4.1%. And uh, calculations have changed on how, how we arrive at that number. Uh, it seems like the Fed is getting a bit more nervous. And uh, in, the, in that regard, I'm sure they're looking at the U6 number as well, it, which is steadily increasing. Um, at what point should we all get nervous? I think we should be very nervous right now, frankly. Um, because, you know, a bit like Hemingway's bankruptcy, um, you know, <laughs> slowly at first and then suddenly. Um, I think we should be getting nervous now. And, and again, another part of the economy to look at would be consumer spending. <laughs> and we, I know we talked about this last time because it's, it's, <laughs> it's been true for six months, but it's now just getting worse. Consumer spending has been going up. So the bulls are saying, well, the consumer's strong, the consumer's still spending. Now, first of all, Consumer growth, growth in consumer spending was was less than the rate of inflation, so that in itself is a bad sign. It means the economy, the the consumer is not continuing to buy as many things as he was before, or change in the quality, going from you know name brands to store brands, etc. But now we're starting to see the consumer spending slow, and at the same time, credit card debt 
zooming, and uh, buy now, pay later, zooming. So people are not buying out of income. And so again, consumer spending can continue to move up for a little bit longer, but if the consumer is not buying out of um, income, did I say savings earlier? I meant income. Yeah. If the consumer is not buying out of income, it's not sustainable. It's not. It's not a good a good condition to be in. Yeah. Ye yesterday or two days ago, Sunday was the uh, busiest travel day according to TSA data in in the U.S. And uh, we've we've seen a couple of numbers and statistics that over thirty percent of uh, U.S. Uh, consumers are willing to go into debt this year to to spend on summer travel, which is really concerning in my opinion. A trip to Disneyland, for example, puts everybody into debt. Right, right, absolutely. And with credit card, uh, most of this is credit card debt, of course. Yeah. You don't go to the bank and get a loan to go to Disney. <laughs> um, credit card debt is, what, 24% average now? But on for a lot of particularly lower credits, it's 30%. Well, if, if you borrow, I don't know what it costs to take a family of four to Disney, but it's going to be $5,000 for that trip, right? Somewhere you borrow right 5000 yeah. you put $5,000 on a credit card and you can't pay you can't pay it off next month obviously because if you could pay it off next month you wouldn't have borrowed it in the first place um when when you're when you're paying 30 percent interest compounded daily that puts you in a really bad spot a uh, really big hole uh it, it, it's mind-blowing like yeah how, how that works and why don't we stop spending like why is there no and bubble behavior is a, a term i've used sort of in uh, in another conversation because it feels like well i'm going to go spend that money and don't worry about it like the u.s government is going to take care of us is that something that you're witnessing as well because it, it's mind-blowing to me because i wouldn't say i live frugally don't get me wrong but I, besides my mortgage i don't have any debt right right so and i would never buy a tv if i can't afford it Right, right. So I'm curious, no. like, what is that? Like, where does that behavior come from, and how can we sort I, of? I think you're right. We've had several years, particularly since COVID, of course, but we've had several years now where the government is just handing out money, and the government is also writing off debt. So you had student loan debt. Don't worry about it. That's now gone. You know, not for everybody, but no. uh, they wanted to do it for everybody, but the Supreme Court shut them down, as you know. But uh, Different sectors now have their student. So I think a lot of people, their experience of the last, what, five years is, eh, the government will send us some money and debts at some point will be written off. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that behavior is mind blowing to me. Like that that you even act like irresponsibly is the word I was looking for. It's right? very irresponsible. Yeah, like like you. I mean, my, my dad, my dad, well, he's a different generation, of course, but he didn't have a credit card. He refused to get a credit card. Other than the house, other than house, no debt ever. Yeah. Car, we didn't have a car till I was 13. He said, I'm not buying a car till I can afford it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, what, seems what a just, concept, just, right? Yeah, right, mind-blowing, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, especially in the pay now, pay later. Uh, you know, when you buy now, pay later. That kind is of. so dangerous because there's no credit checks or anything. You just say, I want to pay what i don't even know what it is is yeah. it 10 percent down i don't know but whatever it is there's not a credit check or anything you just do it and that builds up and now you've got people who every month they have to pay 500 for this and 600 for that for things that they consumed probably consumed six months ago yeah mind-blowing absolutely mind-blowing we touched on the Fed earlier. Um, yeah. I want to come back to it because, you know, Jerome Powell just spoke in front of the House Banking Committee, Senate Banking Committee. I always confuse the two because House is tomorrow. Um, Senate Banking Committee. But my point is, is like, wh what do you see them doing? Like, how, what would you do and what do you see them doing? <laughs> well, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't able to listen to, the, to, to what Jerome Powell said today. I mean, look, the truth is, the truth is, as everybody knows and Jerome Powell himself knows, they are in a no-win situation. Um, in my view, they're in a no-win situation. Um, if they keep rates too high for too, you know, higher for longer, they really risk the economy um, and, and, and unemployment and, you know, the threat to the federal government finances, of course. And, and the problem, I, I think it's important, sometimes if you put it into a human story term, it, it's easy to understand. You know, the, the individual that bought, the family that bought a used car, you know, five or six years ago, and they probably paid, I don't know what used car loan rates are, to be honest with you, but let's say LIBOR plus five, would that yeah, be reasonable? That probably sounds about right. Yeah. So seven years ago, they would have paid 6%. Now that clunker is dead. Hmm. 
and the guy, the family has to go out and buy a new car. Well, now LIBOR plus five is, oh, what 10%. Is yeah. So um, the rate that they are paying has just gone up. The, the monthly payment has just gone up dramatically. And this is a family that might be living, you know, paycheck to paycheck. So they could just about make the paycheck, the, the, the payment on the last car. Now it's suddenly gone up by 60%, 70%. The company that borrowed money five years ago at LIBOR plus two, you know, two and a half plus two, they were borrowing a, four, a good quality, a good, a good credit four years ago, five years ago, could borrow four and a half, five percent. Now they're borrowing at eight, nine percent. I mean, and, and that money is going to roll over. So the higher for longer mantra, uh, the longer we go on with interest rates where they are, then the more households, the more corporations who may be good credits or they may be poor credits, but the more households and corporations suddenly come into the new higher, uh, the higher interest rate environment. Um, I, mean, I mean, if if a company, let's say a company termed out all their debt five years ago, the higher interest rates haven't affected them no. until their debt matures. And then, and they have to roll it over. Then it suddenly affects them all at once. So, uh, I mean, the Fed is in a very difficult position. Jerome Powell clearly, we know this anecdotally uh, from people who know him, Jerome Powell is concerned about his legacy. He does not want to go down as everybody says the other <laughs> Arthur Burns, which is a little unfair on Arthur Burns, but he doesn't want to go down as a person who, you know, cut interest rates too soon and allowed inflation to blossom. And I suspect that if, if Jerome Powell keeps interest rates higher a little longer than he should, but manages to bring inflation down, he can retire when, when it's time for him to step down. Even if the economy is in a little worse shape and unemployment is a little bit higher, he can say, I killed inflation. The truth is he cannot kill inflation in the way that Volcker did. We forget when Volcker came in, the Fed funds rate was already double digits. Mm. So Arthur Burns wasn't quite so bad. <laughs> it was all, well, there was Miller between the two, but um, so we already had the Fed funds rate, I think at 12%, but it was certainly mm. double digits when Volcker came in and Volcker doubled them, more or less doubled. Powell simply cannot double rates from now. I mean, he got way ahead of inflation, Volcker. We simply can't do that right now because of the debt in the economy. I was going to say, like, at one point, does it really become political? So far, it's been highly ignored, especially in the U.S. U.S. elections are you know pending. Uh, come November, we'll, we'll see that happening. But it, it's ignored. It's a topic ignored. When does it really get political? We crossed the trillion dollar uh, trillion dollar threshold for interest payments, which is massive, which is an insane amount of money, right? So I'm curious, like, where does it get critical? Well, I, I mean, I may not be answering your question directly, but. I, I thought I was not one of those people who a year ago thought the Fed was going to pivot immediately or anything like that. But I honestly thought December and, 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 and the very dovish comments we had from Powell in December signified that we were going to get interest rates cuts this year. And I thought March and if not March, June. And obviously it hasn't happened. The thing is, if the Fed doesn't cut rates this month, there's no meeting in August. Um, to cut rates two months ahead of the election, I think would be, let's say, highly controversial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, whatever, you know, whatever economic justification they give for it. And, you know, Powell's always going on about it, the Fed, we don't think about the election. Of mm -hmm. course they do. They know it's there. Yeah. They're not, you know, <laughs> they know it's there. They can't, they can't change the direction of policy two months two months before an election. That is just too, too, um, it would be too controversial. So if they don't cut rates now, I, 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 I think it's, you know, after the election. Not December then probably yeah. the first rate cut, but uh, the economy is surprisingly strong still. Like surprisingly, like we, we look at their their cracks. We just discussed it, but like we all expected after, especially after the comments in December, he was super dovish yes. in December. That's when the market completely went, uh, for lack of a better term, went loot, loot, I don't know, crazy. Like you said, well, okay, we're going to six, six, six to seven rate cuts because they completely exaggerated it, 
right? Right, but right. Then the market came back, like unemployment started, um, you know, crept up slower. But it, it looked fine. Well, again, these headline numbers are a little stronger than people were thinking. But I'll say two things about them. One, we've already discussed, yeah. you know, and you mentioned U6. I mean, some of these numbers are not quite as strong as perhaps they they appear. If you have a low labor participation rate, so your denominator is lower, of course your uh, unemployment rate is going to be lower, other things being equal. But I think the other thing is... You know, the average length of time in the U.S. from the, from the start, from the, from the first rate hike to the onset of a recession, the average length of time going back to the 60s, 1960s, has been almost 50 months. Now, there's one outlier in there, so let's take the outlier away just to be fair, be devil's advocate. It's still like 27 months. So when was the first rate hike in the U.S.? March 22. So what's that? That's 23. 27 months. 27 months. So we're only just at the average, right? We're only just at the average of when a recession should be starting. By its nature, if you have an average, sometimes you're lower, sometimes you're you know, shorter, sometimes you're longer. So there's nothing at all unusual, nothing at all unusual in the fact that it's been 27 months since they first rate, raised rates and we haven't had a recession yet. I will add to that that given that before they started raising rates, we had 12 years of excessively easy money, money monetary policy, and particularly the three years before they raised, um, before they started raising rates, um, that gives people more runway. That, that means that corporations and households should be and were in a much stronger shape at the onset of the rate hiking cycle, so you would expect a you would expect a time lag to be longer. So, yeah. in other words, I don't think it's at all I don't think it's at all unusual that, that it's been so long without a recession. So we're going to overcarry the baby a bit, and then we do induce, what? We overcarry the baby. There's, overcarry there's, the like baby. Like I'm using the 40 week analog because oh. if you're over by a, a couple of weeks, you start oh, you I induce see. you induce right. I'm Enough. sorry. Okay. Yeah, right. But uh, we, would you induce a recession? I think that's a, it was a stupid comparison a bit. No, but, no, uh, it sort of reminded I, sorry, me of no, that. No, I got you. I got you. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think Powell wants a recession. Yeah. Um, but but above all else, he really wants to get inflation down before he leaves. But the danger is that the longer you wait to cut rates, um, the more danger we are in the economy. Yeah. What, what camp are you in? No landing, soft landing, hard landing. Curious. Well, what your certainly not no landing. Hmm. And certainly not soft landing. I mean, it could be a moderately hard landing. Well, no, no. I give you three options. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I only have three to pick from, then it's a hard landing. Hard. I mean, I think it's a recession. I think we're going into a, a, a recession. The only thing that's going to stop the recession, if, a, if the government, which is not out of a realm of possibility at all, if the government just starts, uh, you know, they start printing money again, the Fed monetizes debt, and they just start handing out helicopter money again just like the checks during covid just keep it going by by um issuing money and i, I i'm not that's not out of a realm of possibility at all but that would be extremely dangerous how, how do you define a hard landing what, what, what will it look like if it really happens well you're the one using the word i'm not okay. so i'm just saying we're going to have a recession which means the okay. the economy is going the gdp okay, is then going what to go is, negative what is that going to look like yeah. well it's how are we going to feel it, it maybe it, well, it means unemployment is going to move up and maybe even on the, um, I don't even know what they call this one, but it's not U6. Hmm. I don't know what they call it. I think it. U3, I think is the normal yeah, one. Yeah, it's not U2. That's a rock band, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay, so, um, you know, that will get up to 5 or 6%, which would mean under U, U6 would be a 10 or 11%, oh. which is pretty serious. Um, it means a lot of bankruptcies. Already, small bankruptcies have shot up to the highest level in over 10 years. Uh, that's a sort of silent thing that nobody's looking at. But we'd get more bankruptcies, and that would be bankruptcies of households and corporations, small corporations and larger corporations. It's going to be, I think, very, very damaging for the people in the lower 50% in terms of assets and income. It's very, very damaging. Yeah. There's a SAM rule. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but the SAM rule looks at unemployment and it takes the average of the last three months, which is about 4% right now, and it compares yeah. it to the same period last year where it was about 3.6%. And the SAM rule says like, if it's over 0.3% change, 
uh, is to the upside, it, we're in a recession. That's sort of what the yeah, rule yeah, dictates. Yeah. It's yeah. quite math- math- mathematical, but apparently that's that's a thing because you'll always find a, a mathematical theory or something sure. that fits your narrative. But if I were to tell you that we're in a recession right now, would you agree or disagree? Uh, no, I, I would think that for half of the population, this is a recession. Um, of course, as you know, the technical definition mm-hmm. of a recession is two, two, no. G, two quarters of GDP, negative GDP back to back. And and that's called by the National Bureau uh, of Economic Research. Um, and, and so we're not there in that technical definition yet. But but yes, I mean, I, I think we're I think we're we're just on the cusp. I'm trying to figure out a segue to, to come to commodities and, and, and to gold because gold gold price is hanging in there. It's it's trading at 2360. It's, it's a very high level. It's nearing all time highs, like not like the main markets, but we're, sure. we're not far off anymore or, or again or off from the all time highs. What, what's the sentiment like? Well, the sentiment um, in the West is still pretty negative, right? Um, you look at the you look at the uh, coin dealers. Uh, you look at uh, 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 deliveries from the mint are lower. You look at premiums on coins; they're lower. These are reflections not of a strong market but of oh. weak demand. Then you look at uh, uh, GDX and and the other gold ETFs. The gold ETFs in in North North America and Europe are still seeing net outflows. So you look at a GDX for the last three months, and um, I mean, my gosh, we've only had about eight days where there have been net inflows. I mean, it's astonishing in the last three months, even though gold has moved up. And the same goes, which is even perhaps more surprising to me, with the gold stocks. You look at, did I say GDX? I meant GLD, sorry. No, you said phys- GDX, yes, but you meant GLD. I right? meant yeah. GLD, the physical gold. Now we'll switch to the gold stock ETFs, um, of which the GDX is the largest. And in the last three months, it's been $1.3 billion of outflows. $1.3 billion of outflows. If you look at the uh, they, uh, uh, Van Eck reports, see inflows and outflows on a daily basis. Some days there is nothing reported because it was too small, uh, you know, and it just stays in cash. But the days when they actually invested or had to sell, there's only been about seven days in the last three months mm-hmm. where there have been net inflows. It's astonishing. And the net inflows have been, by and large, pretty small compared with the net outflows. Now, we we manage a, a gold mutual fund, as you know, for Peter Schiff of uh, the Euro-Pacific. I'm not allowed to talk specifically about our fund, but let me just say that when I talk to all of the, when I talk to other uh, gold mutual fund managers, um, everyone, so you can <laughs> infer what's happening to us, everyone is seeing outflows. Right. It's astonishing. Now, these outflows may not be dramatic, but they're steady outflows. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the ordinary investor in the US, um, I, I think there's a lot of things going on. But 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 we can say the ordinary investor in the U.S. is is not a believer that the market has turned yet. Is the gold price too high? Is it too expensive? Or no. is it perceived as expensive? No, I don't think that's it at all. No, because as you know, with most <laughs> markets, people pour in the higher it goes, right? <laughs> We've seen that Tesla stock, for example, yeah. it reaches all time high and just keeps going. <laughs> so so no, I don't think that's it at all. I think the plain fact is that um, you know if you look at a macroeconomic environment and look at the things that drives gold. You know, lower um, uh, lower interest rates or negative real interest rates and higher inflation and weaker dollar and 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 softer economy, meaning the Fed's going to start cutting rates and 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 um, a, a weak stock market. Well, that's not the environment we're in right mm. now. You and I, or I'll speak for myself. I may say things aren't quite as strong as they appear. And we may look ahead and say they're going to get worse. But the plain fact is, if you look at the macroeconomic environment right now, it is a negative environment for gold. And so the ordinary investor perhaps sees that. And what's been driving gold in particular, of course, are things, you know, central bank buying because of dollar weaponization, Chinese investors buying um, because they're worried about the banking system, Well, these people are not worried about the macroeconomic environment. That's not why they're buying gold in the first place. So it's not illogical that gold is moving up to new highs 
and we're still not seeing a flood of people uh, pouring into gold stocks. Yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting. Like you mentioned the coin dealers here at this conference. I had a couple of conversations with them as well. And they've been telling me that some of their clients are actually selling gold to yep. cover credit card debt. Uh, no, absolutely. Well, I was going to mention another thing. You know, I manage, I mentioned I manage Peter Schiff's gold fund, but I also manage separately managed accounts. Mm. So with separately managed accounts, you get, um, uh, you know, you get a very good sense of what's happening. When I get clients with, let's say, half million dollar accounts that I've had for 10 years, and they suddenly ask me for a $15,000 withdrawal or a $12,000 withdrawal, something is going on. Right. This is not a person who says, I'm now retired. I want 20,000 every quarter. This is a one off. Hey, I just want to take 12,000 from my half million dollar account. Something is going on. And I think that's a very bad sign about what's happening in the economy. Where are things going to go? Like, and how much is maybe a rate cut already priced into the gold price? Oh, I, I don't think the gold price is, I, I, I may be wrong, but I don't think the gold price is pricing in rate cuts at the moment again because look who's buying it's central banks who are buying they don't care what the fed does about rate cuts it's chinese buyers they don't even know what the fed does about rate cuts there's also clearly some additional buying when you add up the numbers you know you look at the central bank buying which is reported the chinese buying where you have very good numbers from the shanghai exchange and from hong kong imports in into china and you have Chinese gold production, of course, which all goes to the central bank. But in terms of a, uh, in terms of a consumer in China, it's the Shanghai Exchange and it's it's Hong Kong imports. You look at those numbers, and then you look at the ETFs, and you look at the outflows from the ETFs. There's a missing component, right? There's a missing component, and the missing component, I think, are a few discerning, intelligent, <laughs> um, but but wealthy. A few wealthy individuals and families in the Middle East, in Asia, and also in North America, but but a few wealthy individuals who are buying gold over the counter, so it, the individual trades are not getting reported, right, in the way that individual uh, central bank, bank purchases and sales are being reported. They're not being reported, um, but this is OTC, over-the-counter buying of gold. Um, and that's what driving gold. And I don't think those people are buying because of Federal Reserve um, uh, 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 interest rate cuts. I think they're buying because they're worried about the fragility of the system, frankly. Now, re really interesting conversation there, Adrian. And I'm, I'm curious, like, what should the common investor do right now? Like you said, we're not in a gold market, really, because there's a lot of competition out there. Let's be honest. Like the sure. S&P is producing, what is it, almost 20% annual returns. You'd be stupid to put that money into a gold, into, into bullion almost that doesn't <laughs> produce a yield, right? So I'm curious, like, what, what should the common investor do? Let's, well, again, not investment advice, of right. course, but curious what your well, thoughts are. As, as I say, the macroeconomic environment, all of the factors that normally drive gold, are actually negative right now. That's a positive, mm. if you're a contrarian, because it only means, you know, the Fed has to cut rates, or inflation has to go back up, or the dollar has to fall, or the economy has to slow, or the stock market has to, doesn't have to collapse, but it has to roll over. Um, are any of those things possible in the next six months? <laughs> I would say absolutely overwhelmingly, yes. So w when the macroeconomic environment starts to shift, uh, investors will turn, ordinary investors and small institutions will turn towards gold. And w with regard to the gold stocks, um, again, you only need, remember, you, you mentioned uh, uh the, the stocks that continue to, to, to grow. The S&P this year, um, well, the S&P and NASDAQ are the two best-performing markets, best-performing major markets this year. In the last quarter, Hong Kong outperformed, but um, on, a, on a recovery bounce. So, so these markets are continuing to go up, but everybody knows, I mean, I think it's well publicized, that NVIDIA represents half of the gain. One stock represents half of the gain. Let's just think about that for a second. And, and then you look at this, we've got, a, we've got an all-time high in the market, but we've got more individual stocks hitting 52-week lows and 52-week highs. The breadth in this market is astonishingly bad. And when you see that, that is typically the precursor of a market that's going to fall. I read something, and I'm not 100% sure, so I won't say it, and I apologize for not that attributing it to somebody else. But he looked at all the different indicators of the market. 
And his conclusion was, I am not stating that the market is going to go down a lot in the near term, but this is what a market peak looks like. If this is, a, you know, this is what a market peak looks like. And I think we're, we're, we're at that point. You look at the gold stocks, they are selling at very close to multi-decade lows in valuations, which is just nonsense. You look at Agnigo. Agnigo Eagle, which is the third largest gold mining company in the world, and there's no particular hairs on it, meaning there's no particular reason anyone can point at Agnigo and say, oh, well, that's why <laughs> that's cheap, you know, because they're in Pakistan or <laughs> something. Um, and yet it's selling at about 2%, within 2% of its lowest price to cash flow it's in, in this entire history. Now, with gold at record highs, does that make logical sense? Can it last? Well, one of the things that's going to change it, I think, is you look at the quarter that's just finished, the second quarter, and the gold, the gold price was $250 an ounce higher on average than the average selling price in the first quarter. We forget that gold only really moved up in March, right? So the average selling price for the first quarter was $2,070. For the second quarter, it's $250 higher than that, and yet the costs will be more or less the same. The oil price just a dollar or two higher on average. Commodity currencies, Australia dollar, Canadians dollars, South African rand, more or less the same. So the margins, what I'm saying is the margins, meaning the cash flow, should be very, very strong when these companies start reporting. I have to think, partly because I'm a rational person, partly because I'm an optimist, <laughs> but I have to think if you have two back-to-back -back quarters of strong cash flow for gold stocks, someone <laughs> somewhere is going to notice. So somebody might wake up to it, actually. Yes. Exactly. I was looking for a statistic while you were chatting earlier, because Morningstar put something out that it's not a stock picker's market these days, and uh, the overall market. Not, not the mining stocks, but yeah. the overall market. Because uh, in, in the first half of the year, only 18.2% of actively managed mutual funds and ETFs that compare themselves to the S&P actually outperformed it. Right. So, well, and, 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 and it's down. That number is down from the last few years. And, you know... It's very, very difficult. We're an active, we're an active manager, but I don't like to compare myself to the S and P. Um, I, I don't think relative to. I've never liked the idea of relative performance. I mean, I know you have to compare yourself to something, but I don't like the idea of re relative performance. But it's very. So we're a global manager. So I look at the Morgan Stanley Capital International World Index. <laughs> Um, which is obviously much more diversified. For an S&P manager, it's very difficult. If half your gain is from one stock, what do you do as an active manager? Do you put half your money into a clearly overvalued stock, however great a company it is, but a clearly overvalued stock? Do you put half your money into one stock? That's a very difficult decision to hopefully, make. Hopefully the compliance department calls you on that and <laughs> yeah. says, like, you can't do that. And so <laughs> you're going to underperform. Yeah. You're automatically. Going to it happens automatically. Yeah. yeah. Now, I will say, so what you're saying is absolutely right, but I will say in the gold sector, I think um, we all know in the gold sector, it's a much smaller sector, of course, but we all know there's good companies, bad companies. And very bad companies. And very bad companies. <laughs> so when you buy a gold ETF, you're buying the good, the bad, and the ugly, and there's no way around it, and it's all market-weighted. Yeah. So they're not, the, 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 the manager of the gold ETF is not even saying, well, we're buying everything, but let's buy a little more of a good one. No, no, good <laughs> ones. No, it's all market-weighted. And I think that, I mean, I think, frankly, empirically as well as theoretically, that's just a bad way to manage <laughs> money. Um, so I don't know why I got onto that, but anyway, so, <laughs> no, so true. yeah, I, 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 I think stock picking is, is, is essential in, in the gold, gold sector. Personally, and I've mentioned that probably in other conversations before, I'm not a big fan of ETFs, like especially no. in the mining stocks, because yes, you might actually add some liquidity, but you're not helping the companies. In my well, opinion, because you're not buying too. private placements, well, you know, money's not flowing directly into the, the companies. The money's not flowing to the companies, no, so, no. And you're rewarding the ugly as well as the yeah. good, yeah. And you can easily outperform as well if you just In stock gold, you properly. can underperform, yeah. It, with the S&P, it's been very, very difficult. To, yeah. I, I mean, our, our, our global accounts have underperformed the S&P for the last three years. It's very difficult, I think, to un outperform the S&P. Now, you know, we... we I don't like to invest in companies that I don't understand. So I haven't been in NVIDIA and Tesla and, 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 and um, 
uh, some al- alphabet meta. and so on. A yeah. meta, yeah, definitely not a meta. <laughs> um, so we've underperformed. In the gold sector, um, what well, you said is easy to understand, so I'm not <laughs> bragging now. <laughs> when, when, I, when I say that we've, un- we've outperformed, you know, the, the XAU is a benchmark yeah. we use, but it could be the GDX, a pretty similar. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, with, with a, only a couple of exception, sep- exceptions, we've outperformed, you know, in 40-year history. Yeah. So, um, fantastic. Yeah. No, it's like, let's, let's put a bow around the conversation. Like, are we going to sit here when we, if we were to repeat this conversation right now, December 31st, will we smile or cry? I, I, th- I think we will be crying about the economy, but smiling about gold and gold stocks. Fantastic. Awesome. Adrian, where can we follow your work? Yeah, the website is adrianday.com. Easy. Fantastic. I can remember that one. Fantastic. I'll put that also in the show notes, of course, okay. as well. The Adrian, thank you so much for your time. It was a great pleasure catching up with you. Thanks thank for making you. the extra time here, staying a bit longer no, uh, on the conference you. floor. No, thank you. You're welcome. My, people might have noticed it's awfully quiet behind us right now, so, <laughs> but it's great. It's, audio quality is going to be superb on this one. So, Okay. <laughs> no, fantastic. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially from the floor of the Rules Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. If you enjoyed this conversation, leave a like, leave a comment. We do want to hear from you. Leave some constructive feedback. What do you think is happening? Are we going to be crying at the end of the year uh, or happy tears happy tears sad tears you know um, l- l- let's talk about that we really want to hear from you hit that like and subscribe button it helps us out tremendously getting fantastic guests like adrian on the channel thank you so much for tuning in we'll be back with lots more here from boca raton <laughs>